They're building blocks very cleverly, England, and I think we all need to keep our eyes, you know, sharply posted. She's got those Laura Langman qualities about her. She's got a massive engine. She's gritty. She's hard-nosed. Yeah, I just thought Maddie at the World Cup. I think we, we missed a flip there. And Kudos to Amelia Ann. I mean, she was just incredible. I, I still think that the Silver Ferns are a formidable force and vastly different when you've got Nowecki sitting at the front. I'm going to give that a no. Yeah, I, I think um, she needs to sit on the sideline and get the feel for what it's like to play against the Diamonds. I too was a little baffled not to see Berger and Watson out on the court. Still think Maya Wilson should start the game. I think on Australian soil, it's you know that's a big ask for a young kid. No mai ki te hōtaka o te niti poro kiwi. I'm Bridget Tunnicliffe and we're coming up to the Silver Ferns final test series of the year and it's the one everyone looks forward to most, the Constellation Cup with great rivals Australia. It's fair to say the Silver Ferns have had a tough year while Australia have turned everything they touch into gold. So how might the Silver Ferns fear? To help me preview the series, I'm joined by the New Zealand men's coach Dion Tefitu and Australian commentator Sue Gordian. Kia ora. Uh, first off, Dion, you're heading to Australia tomorrow with the New Zealand men's team who will be playing Australia and curtain raises to the Constellation Cup. How's the team shaping up? Yeah, the team team's looking good. We um, unfortunately, you know, we, we still don't get any funding um from anyone so with that there's a couple of the players um that would have been in the team have had to pull out due to you know buying houses and all sorts of adult things having babies so um we're 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 a little light um on experience but the players that are there um they're fizzing and you know there's uh, there's not many caps on the team but the ones that are there they're they're ready to roll uh, so just saw the news that the Australian Netball Players Association has rejected the collective player agreement proposal. They are now asking for mediation. You're also involved in recruitment in your role at the West Coast Fever. How frustrating is this becoming? Oh, yeah, frustrating for everybody, no doubt. Um, I think we'd all like to contract teams and, and move on. Uh, look, I'm not surprised by both sides going public today, but I don't know really what it achieves except just bringing the public up to speed with where things are at, uh, whether mediation comes to fruition or not. just seems that two sides have a very solid stance about where things are at. So um, I'm really not sure where we go to from here, but I'm sure the powers to be will sort something out. Yeah, let's hope that gets sorted out soon. Um, well, let's just take a look back at the Tiny Jamison series. It was only, what, a, a couple of weeks ago. I'm not sure how much you saw of it, Sue, but Silver Ferns winning the series 2-1 after a shock loss to an understrength England team in the opening test. What did you make of the way the series played out? I did watch the series. Uh, I think particularly after Game 1 and all the uh, the media sensation around England's win, um, I think drew everybody's eyes, didn't it? Which, you know, it was, was interesting. Um, what did I make of the series? Uh, probably a lot of questions for New Zealand to continue to answer, but I, um, and I think in different areas of the court, and we can probably talk about that as this unfolds. Um, for England, you know, it's, it's, it could have gone either way. They they made a big bold statement in sending out a side that was um, minimal in caps and and certainly futuristic, but it paid off for them, didn't it? And now we're all talking about what great depth they've got and watch out England. So um, a big risk. Um, and I'm I'm not overly concerned about where I think the Silver Ferns are at, but um, I am certainly mindful of what England are doing. Yeah, I mean, so when you think about the England shooting end for the next cycle, Housby Cardwell, then throw Sasha Glasgow into the mix, Barry Neal, George Fisher, Liv Sheen. I mean, wow. Yeah, blessed, isn't it? And I think it's always interesting when, and you know, you guys can can refer back to the, you know, the Irene and Maria days that when you get two fairly formidable goalers, there seems to be this kind of backup of talent that keeps coming through. And, and England are in that predicament, I think, at this particular point in time. I think Sasha Glasgow's going to be a really interesting one. Her move most likely that we'll hear she'll line up alongside Eleanor Cardwell in the Australian League next year. Um, and, and that's only going to serve their purpose even even better. But certainly in terms of depth, um, you know, they, they are, they're building blocks very cleverly, England, and I think we all need to keep our eyes, you know, sharply posted.
Yeah, I agree. Um, Dion, in terms of how uh, New Zealand went, um, positives in the attacking end, but the series left me with questions marks over the New Zealand defensive circle. You know, one game, Kelly Jury and Phoenix Karaka can be so dominant, and the next test, test three, they can be beaten. I'm not convinced that Karaka and Jury are our strongest defensive combination. Yeah, look, I, I think... Part of our problem is teams are doing their analysis and are no- noticing the style of defence that, that Kelly will go and sit out on the left or right wing. Um, and there's so many free looks just straight into the shooter. And um, that's something that we need to address and we need to address it immediately. And I'd, um, bless Kelly, she's a great player, but um, unlike Jane, I just don't think she has that ground speed to cover to get back into the circle when those passes are thrown. You know, are they oil and water, those two? Are they just not going to work together? Is, is that what we're seeing? And maybe we need to look at some other combinations. And um, we may see that um, in this series coming up. Yeah, I mean, I like that the Nolan Stuck wanted to try and stick with the seven and the third test. And I was all for it for five of those p- positions. The exception being, though, not um, bringing Jane Watson and Karen Berger into the mix in that mm. defensive end. I, yeah. I felt like she needed to do that. Yep, yep. You've got uh, two players that play in the ANZ comp together, um, pretty much rack up, you know, the best defensive record in the ANZ together. Um, I think it left a few people scratching their heads, but then, you know, is, is there a bigger picture behind that? I was surprised not to see them come on in the second half in the third test against mm. um, the Roses. I was really surprised. Let's look at the positives, though. Amelia and Ekinasio was at her vintage best, and... Amelia Wormsley, I mean, oh, what a difference it made to the attacking end. Um, so what did you make? I, I imagine you haven't seen a lot of Amelia Wormsley? No, I, that was my first real glimpse of her, to be blatantly honest with you. And, and you know, like exciting, great future ahead. But I want to pause on that because I I think that you have to, you, you have to pay absolute um, kudos to, to Amelia Ann. I mean, she was so, in, like... So impressive in every facet of the game, you know, like just her leadership, the way she spoke to the media, the way she continued to talk on court with Amelia, like she just led. I I, I couldn't speak more highly about your captain at the moment. I thought she was just incredible. I thought after the first test when you lost, she was accountable for the team. She took it on her shoulders as a captain. She said, we need to be better. And then I thought she led by example when she stepped out. And if you're a young kid in the goal circle and you've got that kind of leadership and strength out the front, all you want to do is be brilliant. And I thought that's, that probably was what brought out the best in Amelia, but I still sit back and it's great because you've got to develop depth. But, you know, we're all sitting here twiddling our thumbs waiting for grace and I'm not aware whether there's any further updates on on her potential heading into this cup, but I know she's been named. But, you know, I, I still think that the Silver Ferns are a formidable force and vastly different when you've got Nowecki sitting at the front. Yeah, I agree. Um, Dion, what did you make of the attacking end and just the easier flow of ball through to our attackers in, the, in those last two tests? Yeah, I think um, we're seeing a, maybe maybe we're seeing a change of the guard um, this year that's going to roll into next year. You know, our centre wing attack um, wing defence combo, the young guns, I thought they did a great job. I thought Mila and, and Maddie were superb um, at times and I think um, time to, more time together on court, they'll, they'll be amazing. Um, I've, I've mentioned Amelia Ann before, you know, what better person to, to have in front of you for... for um, Oh, we've got Amelia Ann and Amelia, so at uh, Wormsley, um, you know, she's she's lucky girl to to have that. And um, but you know, I think I mentioned maybe earlier this year that Wormsley was was potentially ready for a, a black dress sitting on the bench, but she just came out and rocked it. Yeah, so good to know that Ignacio still got it because she was when she's at her best, she, she's incredible. Um, yeah, yes. yeah, I thought that Maddie Gordon at centre worked really well. Uh, I did wonder at times at the World Cup why Gordon didn't play centre more. It wasn't until the bronze medal match against Jamaica that Gordon started at centre for the first time and it solved the whole wing defence conundrum. Heffernan could drop to wing defence, but I guess Nolly might have seen that as a risk starting Gordon at centre, having not spent much time, if any time, there in the black dress. 
I feel, Dion, like we, we lost precious time with Maddie. We could have bedded her into their centre position, given she debuted for the Silver Ferns in March 2021, and she's been in and out and in and out, missed out in the Commonwealth Games last year. I, I feel like she's got the qualities to, to be the perfect centre for New Zealand. Absolutely. She, you know, I think um, she's she's got those those Laura Langman qualities about her. She's got a massive engine. Um, she's gritty. She's hard nosed. Um, she, you know, she's not afraid to go for things. But I think with Maddie, the edge that she has over Laura at Laura's same time in her career is, is Maddie's. She's got a really nice feed on her, and she's had that time with Wormsley. I actually thought it was a good move, but yeah, I just thought Maddie at the World Cup. I think you're right. I think we we missed a flip there, and and um, you know, you mentioned the wing <laughs> the wing defence conundrum. Equally, uh, yeah, I mean, equally, Maddie would have been a better option at wing defence than Jury. She, she would have been more obvious to try there than, than Jury if, if Nolan was determined to have Heffin in its centre. Yes, yeah, yeah, you read my mind. And, and I think, um, you know, and then you've you've got Curran, of course, mm. um, who sort of, yeah, she just seems to be a bit out of favour at the moment and hopefully she gets the opportunity this week to to get on court against the Diamonds and just um, and play our play our way back into the front of that um, that starting lineup. Yeah, I think in terms of the Silver Ferns and the Nepal World Cup, I thought Karen Berger and Kate Heffernan were, were possibly our two best players. Yep. Uh, and I've lost yeah. count of how many centres have been tried since Laura Langman retired. There's been so much second guessing around that mid court. Right, let's have a look at the two sides named for the Constellation Cup. The only changes really for Australia are as a result of retirement. Steph Wood and Ash Brazel bowing out after the World Cup. Sue, any surprises around the team that was named? Were some people expecting that Danelle Wallen would be in there? No, oh, gee, you know, like it's, it's it's Australia is looking so good and with such great depth at the moment that it would be only right to say there's probably surprises because you'd be pressed to probably find too many people that come up with the same lineup just with so many options available at the moment. But um, for me, I feel like the reason someone like a Wallum hasn't been selected and, you know, at the moment probably is is going to struggle is because Sophie Garvin stepped up and I think there was there was questions on her selection at the back end of last year, but the way she then performed through the quad series and then held her position into World Cup, even though she had had a substandard Suncorp Super Netball season and then just stepped up in in the World Cup. I mean, you can't go past her. So she's a formidable shooter and a different style and version to someone like Cara Conan. So there's no need to add a Danelle Wallen because she's just another shooter. What we really need is to replace Steph Wood's ability out the front and the smarts and the long range shot. And that is Sophie Dwyer. And I think I've said this a couple of times before, watch out, because this kid, this kid is quite extraordinary. Um, and she's got little bits of, of Sherelle McMahon, Kath Cox, um, even a little bit of Susan Pettit or Susan Prattley, you know, like she's just this mixture of player. But um, she's really exciting. And, and she's going to have a bit of an international journey and challenge because she'll spend some time on the bench, but it's not a play, bad place to be alongside the Kira Austins and the Sophie Garvins and the Cara Conans for the moment. But when she gets on, um, if she can take what she does at a, a National League level um, and that same sort of confidence, I think she's a great choice for Australia moving forward. And as for Kate Maloney, well, I only read, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, Mirinkovic in an article coming out just saying Maloney's simply been rewarded just for her efforts and persistence and, and being there and thereabouts. So um, whilst I think in Australia at the moment we have quite a lengthy and formidable uh, mid-court depth. Um, I think Maloney's deserved of this opportunity, but I think she's going to have to perform because there are a number of players biting at her heels. You mentioned there the depth. You know, the fact that Australia were able to start the World Cup final with one shooting lineup that was going well and then replace that pathway through the game and finish even stronger. Have you ever had that much shooting depth in the Australian side? Yeah, do you know what? It's um I think that the you've just named it there. The point of difference was these two formidable combinations that I think Stacey Marinkovic has been working on in the background and being being able to pull that lever and kind of switch them over and then have them actually click into gear almost immediately was was pretty impressive. And I think when you go back, we've had 
we've had some decent depth in our shooting circles, but it's been more just a singular change, you know. And um, I think yeah, at the moment this was quite incredible. But Steph Wood was a master and, you know, like you go back to the World Cup, not so much the gold medal game, but, uh, you know, that preliminary final that got Australia into the World Cup gold medal game and we wouldn't have got there without Steph Wood. So she is an enormous loss for Australia and it will be felt because she is the playmaker and the sergeant out the front. Whether or not that then frees up a bit of space for Liz Watson or offers a bit more space for Kira Austin to show her creativity, but it'll be interesting just to see how they click with no Steph Wood. Let's have a look at the Silver Fern side. Really, the only difference from the Tiny Jamison series is that defender Kate Burley is a potential debutante and Grace Wickey has been named subject to medical clearance. I think the latest is that she's looking like she might be ready for the last two tests, which um, yeah means that it, it might come down to Maya Wilson and Amelia Wormsley for that goal shoot bib. Dion, if Grace isn't available, do you start Amelia in Test 1, first game against Australia on Australian soil, right into the lion's den. But, I mean, I guess she's, she's got to start somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to give that a no. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think um, she needs to sit on the sideline and get the feel for what it's like to play against the Diamonds. Yeah, I, I would hate her to go out there. You know, I think if you think back many years ago, we had a young Danica Whippieti, sorry, who... Um, mm sort of got thrust in what I felt was too soon around the same age now as what Wormsley is and um, it dented her for a little bit. Uh, I've met Wormsley a couple of times and um, she's a pretty strong character but I think if she just has a chance to to just watch from the sideline and she's got four tests you know so even if she watched for a half and they put her on but I definitely think that she, she's quite capable to go out there but starting the first test I'll probably say no personally. <laughs> Yeah, um, so Maya Wilson knows what it feels like to um, feel the ferocity of the Australian defenders. You know, which way does a coach go on on this kind of call? Well, it depends what the coach is trying to achieve, and it's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because you were talking earlier about the defence, and again, I too was a little baffled not to see Berger and Watson out on the court, and um I just feel like the two formidable foes at the moment for New Zealand being Australia and England, we play similar styles in 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 attack. And I just feel like the doggedness of Berger, the doggedness of Watson, it can upset Australia. And I just don't understand why that's not happening. But then the, in, in a long way of answering your question, and not that I ever want to put an age stamp on any player, but is the vision casted forward to the future? And if that's the case, what does this mean? So it's the same thing when you say to Maya Wilson. I still think Maya Wilson should start the game. I think on Australian soil, it's 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 you know that's a big ask for a young kid to step on who you know who hasn't seen Australia before as such. But the other thing here is if Maya doesn't step on and do what's expected of her, and I do think at times she can be really one-dimensional. She's a great screen player, but when the defence works out her screens, I don't feel like she's got a lot of other sort of cards to play. And 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 she may have them and may be told that's the way she needs to play the game. But if she can't deliver a B plan and Australia work that out defensively, well then you've got to pull, you've got to change it. And um, maybe that's where Wormsley gets a, a, a nod and debut. So we'll have to wait and see. I think it's a really interesting time for the Silver Ferns, and it's it's a it's a more interesting time, particularly for those of us that have a coaching background, to sit and watch what Nolene's doing at the moment. So um, all eyes on the coach. Yeah, I hundred percent agree with what you're saying. So, like, what is this series about for us? And and I think that'll be evident in the first test. I also can't wait to see what Kate Burley can do. She's really bided her time. She's a mature player. And I feel like if Dion, if she performs well in the Constellation Cup, you know, she could usurp someone like Phoenix Karaka if she does does well against Australia. Yeah, um, I'm not sure where she fits in at international level. I certainly know where she fits in at ANZ level. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how, how she comes out out of the gate. She's got everything, all the qualities. I just think she's just probably a couple of centimetres, you know, in height. But, you know, definitely um, she's got the goods. And I, I would like to see her out there having a run. Absolutely. I think it's her time. It's definitely her time. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I'll, I'll just 
Yeah, I just wanted to add that. So I don't know a great deal about Kate Burley, as in I've you know I've seen her play a couple of games, but probably not enough to to give pure judgment. But obviously, her selection continues to try and unravel this defensive puzzle. But irrespective of who Nolene puts out there, the one thing that's still just lacking for me defensively, and we saw it only in in snippets at the World Cup, is the is that dynamic team defence and I and I feel like we we're getting caught talking so singularly about particular players which historically if I go back there were always standout stars but what we used to talk about was New Zealand's defence you know like the way they defended and you know it wasn't just about sitting in space but it was taking the courage and having the opportunity and if it didn't work then there was that sort of overflow moment and that's what that's where you got caught out Australians would would sort of you know go to throw the first ball and see that the defender coming flying and then think, okay, there's a space, I'll throw the second ball. And all of a sudden the silver fern defense eats it up. And I just feel like that's not happening. So, you know, again, I look at the names that sit on this silver ferns line defensively and I'm like, well, who can do that? Because if that is what the silver ferns are trying to achieve defensively, it's just not there at the moment. So irrespective of who's played what and what caps, who can go out and deliver the game plan? And whether and, and again, as, as Dean and I were mentioning, what is this series about? And if it's trying to find, in particular defensively, players that can do what is expected of them, then that's, you know, maybe that's what Nolene's looking for. I don't know. But again, from me as a commentator and as a former coach and with my eyes on defensively, I'm still waiting to see that defensive spark. Yeah, I agree. I just don't think we've had that real presence on defence for a couple of years now, and that used to be our go-to. We could re- sort of mm. rely on that. Given the recent results from New Zealand, you know, fourth at the World Cup, Dion, what does New Zealand have to do to p- to push Australia? Because based on recent results, it feels like they could struggle. Yep, I, and again, 100% with, agree with what Sue's saying. I, I think that we're looking at a team at the moment that are too worried about stats. You know, we've we to your point, Sue, we've got the players that that can go and um have a go at ball and and you know do do what um the ferns are known for doing on defense. Are the reins being pulled on the girls? You know, are they told not to not to go out or or to stay in position? And and you cannot do that against the diamonds. You've got to take your chances. Because if you don't, you're going to get smoked. If you stand there and wait for the diamonds to come to you, you you know you might as well give them the game. And I know I'm being a bit brutal here, but I just I feel as though um, both on defense on, and on attack, it just feels to me that we're playing a sort of a paint by numbers stats sort of game instead of that natural flow that that we are known for. So for me, what do we need to do? We we need to take the reins off, and, and that's plain and simple. And we need to let the girls play. So I spoke to Stars coach Kitty Wills recently and she said New Zealand need to get more innovative. You know, everybody's learnt how to play against New Zealand's style. They've learnt how to combat the zone. Do New Zealand need to mix it up a bit, do you think? Oh, I look, you know, and again, each coach to their own. I think when when the ferns are at their best in that defensive structure, they can upset anybody. That said, though, over 60 minutes of netball, are they capable of delivering that in the modern day game? I don't know. So I guess my answer to that would be, I don't think it would hurt. I think that the more tools or weapons that you've got to deliver and and pull out, the better better off you are. Um, And whilst, you know, when you come over here and, and you play in our domestic league over here, you know, we, we don't, we don't have really that sort of you know the 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 offline or that real sort of um space zone defense on a regular basis so it's not like we're practicing against it week in week out um it's just i guess the skill and the way in which the team at, at the diamonds level is therefore then developed and and ability to execute game plan under pressure um that you know that's seeing them successful at the moment which then you know in in what Dion's saying it's the great dilemma of a coach isn't it because Sometimes you just want the players to play with freedom. But I was going to say it's interesting. And, and again, I'm I'm not massively stat-driven and never was as a coach. But it's interesting, though, that all we've kind of heard Nolene say of late is that, you know, we we get into these great situations and then we're we're throwing ball away at critical time. And, and that's a fair comment. And that's a stat that you have to look at. Um, and if you want to beat, if you want to beat 
Australia, or if you want to, you know, be up there in the top or number one or, or win this series, under pressure and critical moments are the key. So you can't afford to be constantly throwing ball away. And if your opposition's doing it, then you get a little bit of a, you know, I guess a flexibility in what you're doing. But at the end of the day, Australia were quite clinical um, and at World Cup and whether they can continue that in this series, having a bit of time off and, and no internationals leading into this game, who knows? But for me, New Zealand got to, got to shoot, shoot in the high percentages. They've got to be up in the 90s if they want to win. They need to be mindful of critical moments and they've got to have courage in defence and, and, and continue to have courage in defence because you can't go and pull in a different style of defence if you haven't been training it. Back in what you know and have courage to do it. Yeah, Dion, uh, there's been a bit of discussion about should Netball New Zealand allow players to play in Australia's ECCN league? You act as an agent for a couple of New Zealand players. Do you think that could help close the gap? Yep, I do. You only need to look around at what's happening with Jamaica, England, you know, and players from from surrounding areas playing, even playing in the England comp. I, I think we need to um, open our arms wider. We need to embrace different styles. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is to allow our players to go over and experience different styles of play. Now, point in case to that, and you you know that I, um, Bridget, that I, I harp on about this all the time, is in our ANZ, all our teams play box defence. All our teams play a wall defence. off. Like, all our teams play exactly the same. You know, we need our players to be able to go away and experience different styles. And in particular, you know, who better than the, the style of the world champs? Oh, 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 oh,